Good morning, St. Paul's. We're the Duffies. We'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas. Please join us in worship. Join me now in our call to worship. In this season of expectation, we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus Messiah into the bustle of our lives and the hard-to-find moments of solitude. We prepare to welcome Christ Jesus Messiah into our homes and situations. We prepare to welcome Christ Jesus Messiah into our hearts and those often hidden parts of our lives. We prepare to welcome Christ Jesus Messiah for beneath the surface of your story, is an inescapable fact. You entered this world as, a vul as vulnerable as any one of us in order to nail that vulnerability to the cross. Our fears, our insecurities, and our sins. All that can separate us from God, exchanged by your grace for love. We cannot comprehend the reasoning, only marvel at the salvation that comes to us through a baby born in a stable and reaches out to a world in need. In this season of anticipation, we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus, Messiah.
Would you join me now for our prayer of confession? Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there was no God and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. For these things, we ask your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open hearts so we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us to you and build our relationship with you and with those you have given us on earth. Amen. Well, we welcome you once again to St. Paul's Church. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. Because you've joined us here today, would you please take a moment to find us online at stpauls.faith and click the Connect With Us button. This is our online connection card, and we would love to hear from you, to know where you're from and what God might be doing in your life. You're certainly welcome to share a prayer request with us as well so that we know how to pray for you this week. Well, in our connection time this morning, we want to just take a moment to remember the life of Sarah Jane Raber, longtime member who's now gone home to be with Jesus. As is our practice, we'll take just a moment to reflect on her life and her love and her connection to this community. Amen. Well, as we continue our worship this morning, we have another announcement to share with you, and that is this. Our friends over at Echoes, the homeless shelter that is provided in the Elizabethtown area every winter, is in desperate need of volunteers. In fact, they've had to delay their opening by one week because they're still trying to find enough volunteers to operate this winter. If this is an area that you would like to serve and to share a part of yourself to help the most vulnerable in our community. We invite you to go to echoeslancaster.org or to call the church office for more information. We truly need you at this time, St. Paul's. We hope that you'll answer the call.
And now a reading from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hello, we are the Kinseys, Jane and Bob. We are here to light the Advent wreath. I'll be right, reading from Isaiah 52, verses 7 to 9. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Creeping needs. Creeping needs. Like many of you, Christine and I have been doing some much needed renovations to our home during this season of the pandemic. It started innocently enough. One of our appliances was starting to go bad. We had a good run with it over 22 years, but it became clear that it needed to be replaced. So as we began to shop for a new one, we encountered great deals, ironically, with if we just bought multiple appliances at the same time. That led to realizing that we needed also to, to replace this atrocious mint green laminate countertop that we had in our kitchen that was popular back in the 1970s. And then if we did that, then we'd have to paint the kitchen walls to freshen them up. And, and if we painted the kitchen, then we really needed to paint the living room, hallway, and foyer. And if we painted all of that, then we needed to replace the equally atrocious 1970s mint green tile floor uh, that really was starting to look ugly and cracked. Uh, you, you get the idea. Creeping needs. We change one thing, and that makes all of the other things in the room or the house look dated and in need of a fresh new look. You see, that's a real clear lesson. Makeovers have a way of revealing layers of creeping needs. Craving peace is like that too. We go searching for peace in a part of our lives, perhaps our work, our marriage, or our relationships with our teenage son or daughter, or, or in our struggle with loneliness, or in all of the fears related to COVID-19, or the racial tensions, or, or just everybody else's issues that clash with ours. Searching for peace is like creeping needs. You crave it in one area of your life, only to realize that the, the need ripples into other areas of your life as well. Today I want to speak a word of peace into your life. A, a word that comes from the, the Christmas story of Luke, uh, specifically chapter 1, the backstory of Jesus' birth and mission. It's actually the story of the birth of another baby, a boy that we would come to know as John the Baptist, a story of how God speaks a word of peace into two old people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and the people of Israel that they represent, as well as the creeping needs of an entire world. For, for many of us, this story is very familiar. For some of you, perhaps it's the first time you've really heard it. For, for all of us, I invite us to, to listen with fresh ears. Listen to the message of peace. So why not open your Bible to Luke chapter 1. Let me pick up in verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. 
Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Uh, let me pause there. Back in those days, the, the people of Israel believed that when you had a child, you were uniquely blessed by God. But when you didn't have a child, well, you must have done something wrong to anger God. Elizabeth and Zechariah, though, it says here in this verse, were righteous before God, living blamelessly. So it didn't make sense to them why God would not bless them with a child. Every day, every year that passed, their peace was missing. But God had a, had a different plan. And that plan continues on. Look at what it says in verse 8. Once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, Zechariah was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. In verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. It's an incredible, incredible verse of scripture right there. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Many of us long to hear those words. Your prayer has been heard. The verse continues. It says, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. Can you imagine what John was thinking in this moment? How he might have been feeling? Can you imagine him wanting so desperately to believe the words that he was hearing and yet reluctant to open himself up lest he, he move out of his disappointment but, but instead of going into to hope, he would move into despair? Do you know that right now, Someone in your neighborhood, a person that you work with or, or go to school with, perhaps even someone watching this service online today in the very room that you're sitting in, right near you. Do, do you know that someone right now has been so desperate in their prayer and so desperate to believe that God has heard their cry? The story continues. The angel says to Zechariah in verse 14, you, ha you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, as often is the case, God's plan for our lives is so much bigger than our plan for ourselves. God sees our creeping needs before we do. The scripture continues. You know, Zechariah engages the angel. He's still trying to come to terms with what he just heard. So he says to the angel, how can this be? I'm an old guy and my wife is getting up there in years. And the angel replies, hey, 
I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And he says to Zechariah, because you didn't believe my words, from this moment forward, you're not going to be able to speak as a sign of the truth of what I'm about to say. And so he continues to be mute. The story continues on as, as, as Zechariah finishes his duty in the, in the sanctuary. He, he exits and goes home. And everybody around him, all of his relatives, all of the other, other priests around him, see that he can't speak. They all come to the conclusion that something must have happened in that room, in that sanctuary. He must have, he must have encountered something holy. And then we pick up in verse 24. It reads, After those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She was probably shocked. And she said, get this, verse 25, she says, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. So the story continues on. You know, we are, we are going to skip for today. We're going to skip that section where, where Mary comes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And they have their encounter. We're, we'll talk about that at another time. But what we read starting in verse 57 is that Elizabeth goes on to give birth. An amazing moment for her and for Zechariah. And they take the child back to the, to the temple and, and they're preparing to circumcise him. And part of the, part of the ritual for the, for the Jewish people back then is with circumcision, they name the child. And so all of the people are around there saying to Elizabeth, because Zechariah can't speak, so what are you going to name your son? And she goes, we're going to name him John. And they all question that. What do, you, what do you mean John? Nobody in your family is named John. Why don't we name it Zechariah? And so they call Zechariah over, and he, he asks for, a, for the equivalent of a pad and a pen. And so he writes on this pad, his name will be John. In that very moment, his tongue is loosed, and he starts speaking. After nine months of silence, plus, nine months plus of silence, he starts speaking. And what happens is, according to what we read, is the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Verse 67, we read, Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. So in this moment, what Zechariah is doing on behalf of, of the birth of his own son is he's, he's seeing how this birth of John is impacting not only the community of his family and friends, but all of Israel and, in fact, the entire world. Something much bigger is taking place. Something huge and he gets a front row seat. The prophecy of what Ze Zechariah is doing is, is on behalf of his own son. And we read, as we pick up the story in verse 76, we read uh, Zechariah saying now to his own son, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. Verse 78, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Do you see that? Do you see what it says here? By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn of a new day has broken upon us. And that dawn, that light of God's love is giving light to those who sit in darkness, guiding all to the way of peace. 
Friends, when God answers prayers, it's not just about meeting our own individual wants or creeping needs. God is carrying out a plan that's bigger than us. It's bigger than us. And he's using us as his ambassadors of hope and peace to deliver that message. Zechariah and Elizabeth got a makeover. And their makeover impacted an entire people. All of us today, 2,000 plus years later, are still marveling over their story. See, when God does a makeover, his gift of peace doesn't just stop with the original request. God's peace penetrates, pervades, and persuades. It, it penetrates through the, through the darkest times, through the seasons when we feel barren, shining a light of hope and reminding us that there is no darkness that can hide the light of Christ's love. It also pervades. God's peace multiplies. It impacts us on its way to impacting others. God's peace also persuades. When people see God's peace, they want it. When people see God's peace in us, it exposes their longing for that peace as well. You know, when I think of, of my creeping needs, it, means, it reminds me of, of the Apostle Paul's words in Romans 5, starting at verse 1. This is what Paul says. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And then verse 8. Paul says, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, God's response to our creeping needs <laughs> is that, he gives us peace through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. When we put our hope in him, when we put our faith in him, when we put our whole trust in his grace, that's when we find the peace that passes all understanding that Paul references in Philippians 4.7. Friends, are you looking for peace? Is that what you're craving as the year 2020 comes to a close? As life seems out of focus, out of alignment with what you've been used to? Well, then let me invite you to seek the peace that only God can give. For your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you that, that your plans are far bigger than my plans. And I thank you also, Lord, for the, for the creeping needs of our lives because it exposes our need for you, for a makeover a makeover that starts from the inside and works its way to every nook and cranny of our lives. And not only our own lives, but, but, the, but our relationships and, and our communities and our world. 
We are a people who are in desperate need of the light of Christ that comes from both a manger to show us that, that you're with us, as well as from an empty tomb that reminds us that your love, your love cannot be squelched by any darkness. So Lord, for those of us who are craving peace, help us to find that peace in Jesus. And remind us each and every day, Lord, that you are a God who hears our prayer. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we want to share communion together now as the household of faith. Even though you may be sitting at home by yourself, know that you are never alone. You're joining your church family, all of us together in this time of communion. And if you have family members, now would be the time to gather them around the table or around the living room. And also get those elements of, of bread and, and something to drink to join with us for this time of communion. As we share in communion, we remember the night on which Jesus was betrayed when he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke that bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper had concluded, he took the cup and gave thanks and said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you in the sins of all. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these elements. They represent a meal that though we are not worthy of, you offer gladly. We ask now that your Holy Spirit comes down upon these elements, and for us, may they be the very body and blood of Christ. As we take, let us not forget the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross so long ago. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Amen. Amen. As we now take communion with one another, um, take the element that is the bread. And as you do, say these words, the body of Christ broken for me. And in the cup, the blood of Christ shed for my sins. The body of Christ broken for you. Blood of Christ shed for my sins. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ for my sins. Friends, will you pray with us? Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Nourish our souls, nourish our lives, nourish our witness, so that all of what we do, all of what we say, and all of what we become, we may, in fact, be a song of praise to you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us and all that you will do through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thank you for joining us for worship today. It's been a joy to share in this message and ministry with you. As you go forth from this house of worship, always remember that God, God has called us to a very special day, a very special life, to be light, to be salt, so everywhere you go, know that God is with you. He is with you. Emmanuel. God bless you. Have a great week. 
Amen.